Jesus didn't ask, what do people think of my teaching? Or what impression am I making? Reasonable enough questions. He asked, who do people say that I am? It'd be hard to imagine another great religious founder asking such a question. The Buddha wouldn't focus on himself, and I say it to his credit. He would say, there's a way I've discovered, I want you to know it. Muhammad wouldn't focus on himself. He'd say, there's a revelation I've received, I want you to know it. Confucius wouldn't say it's about me. He'd say it's about this path that I found. Then there's Jesus. His question is, who do you say that I am? The whole gospel really hinges on this point. Jesus' identity personally is what it's about. Because throughout the gospels, he consistently speaks and acts in the very person of God. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says, Unless you love me more than your very life, more than your mother and father, you're not worthy of me. You might imagine a religious teacher saying, Unless you love God more than your very life. But to say, Unless you love me more than the highest goods in the world? Jesus says to the paralyzed man, My son, your sins are forgiven. Right away, the bystanders say, who does this man think he is? Only God can forgive sins. Now, here's the point. Jesus compels a choice the way no other religious founder does. Either you're with me, he said, or you're against me. Do you see why? If he is who he says he is, then we have to give our whole life to him. If he is God, then he must be the center of our lives. If he's not who he says he is, he's not a good man. He's a dangerous, misguided fanatic. Jesus, more than any other figure, more than any other religious founder, compels us to make a choice. There's a strange passage in the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel that's rarely commented upon. Jesus and his disciples are making their way from Galilee in the north to Jerusalem in the south. Mark says this, And they were going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them. And they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. This obscure fragment is, I think, very telling. One might be intrigued by a religious teacher, one might be captivated by a spiritual leader, but amazed and afraid. Then we recall that in the Old Testament, awe and fear are two standard responses to God. Having grasped this uniqueness of Jesus, we can begin to look at his preaching and action with greater understanding. He was God in the flesh, Yahweh, moving among his people. Jesus is strange. You know, I, I, I'm going to resist the tendency to domesticate him and turn him into, yeah, he's like, you know, an ancient uh, Deepak Chopra, you know, who had interesting spiritual insights. And the gospel writers told these kind of cool stories to exemplify that. I think he was strange. And so people say that they were amazed and afraid. I don't think anyone's really amazed and afraid of Deepak Chopra. They might find him insightful and helpful, but I doubt they're amazed and afraid. But when someone takes five loaves and two fish and feeds 5,000, that's a little scary. And I think if, if, we, if we domesticate Jesus too much, we take away that dimension from him. They were intensely interested in the fact that Jesus drove out demons, that he performed miracles, that he healed people. Even like the calming of the storm at sea, you know, when that's over, they say, who, who is this? <laughs> Who is this man who can calm the... I mean, they knew all about spiritual gurus. They all had rabbis and teachers and insightful people. But he was so far beyond that. Who, who is this who's calming the, the sea?